and welcome um, to our monthly webinar series. My name is Judy Browse again, and I'm the Executive Director of NAAE, and so thrilled that all of you could join us because today we've got a fantastic webinar all about behavior change and looking at how to evaluate and improve our impact. And we're so lucky to have Amiel with us today, and you'll get the chance to hear her in just a minute, and I'll more formally introduce her in a minute. But I do want to, as always, thank all our affiliate co-hosts from across North America who are working with NAAE to co-host this monthly webinar series. We're so happy that you could be part of this and get the message out to your whole network. And I also want to call out our newest affiliate partner, and that's the EE Association of Illinois. So welcome, Abby, and your team. Happy to have you on board. Um, for those of you who have not been part of our webinars in the past, we have a monthly webinar where we are trying to actually help us all think about new ideas, new ways to, to do our work, showcase some of the leaders who are working directly in environmental education or are working in areas that are related and related disciplines. We're all trying to improve our practice and that's what these webinars are all about. And we would love to hear from you on topics you want, people that you think we should hear from, and we'll keep squeezing them in. Just to let you know, next month we have another wonderful um, webinar scheduled on Wednesday of next month. Just make note of that on September 19th. With Spitfire Strategies, Dennis is gonna talk to us about how to make our presentations better, how we can have more impact. You won't wanna miss this one either. For those of you who have never used Zoom, just wanna again mention everybody is muted and um, the way to talk to us is through the chat box. You can either send something to the panelists, to a specific person, or to everybody. And please feel free throughout to use the chat box to ask questions. Um, you can type in resources or links, anything that'll help everybody on the webinar learn. That's what this is all about. And at various times during the webinar, we'll pause and we'll feed questions to Amiel, and then at the end, we'll do the same thing. So make sure you're keeping an eye on the old chat box. And if you have any technical problems, please email Kristen or Sai. We're so lucky to have both of them on board. Kristen manages our webinars and our research to practice work at NAAE, and Sai is um, our communication specialist. So they're on board if you need anything. So now the best part of the webinar is introducing Amiel, and it gives me such pleasure to have her um, as part of our series today. She's the executive director and co-founder of a group called Impact by Design, and she works with a lot of nonprofits to implement best practice in trying to design programs and help us all think about monitoring, evaluation, and adaptive management. She is one of the most creative and thoughtful people I've ever worked with. She has expertise in designing training programs, facilitating workshops, and helping others understand how monitoring and evaluation can help us, what adaptive management is, and how to think about systems thinking. Uh, she's worked for a number of different organizations like the International Fund for Animal Welfare and RARE before starting her own consulting group. And I'm gonna let her tell you more, but I met her, we're both on the board of a group called the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leaders with the unfortunate acronym of UCL, but we've had a lot of fun and done a lot of sessions together talking about how to build the next generation of conservation leaders. So I am gonna turn this over to Amiel, um, and we're gonna switch screens here for a minute. And as we're doing that, just let you know, she has a PhD in wildlife ecology, statistics, and GIS from Cornell University, so she's really smart. Okay, <laughs> Amiel, take it away. Let's give her all a virtual welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm hoping I'm, uh, I'll make the uh, organizers let me know, making sure that my screen is okay for everybody to see. I am super excited to be here. Really, thank you so much to NAAEE for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, I already see from the chat box that we have people from all over the continental United States, from Florida to Colorado, California, New York, um, Missouri, but we also have Puerto Rico, and then internationally, the UK, Barcelona, Peru, um, Canada. So super excited to be able to um, provide this webinar for folks. And as Judy said, um, this is going to be as interactive as possible. And so please do use the chat room for um, when I ask questions. Um, both Judy and the team and I are going to be monitoring the chat room, but we'll also have a series of polls um, that we'll be using in order for us to interact with um, the material. 
So as Judy mentioned, um, the focus of my webinar today is about behavior change, um, understanding sort of the fundamental principles of, of behavior change science, as well as um, later on moving into evaluating and improving our impact in this field. Um, so as Judy mentioned, um, I am the co-founder and executive director of Impact by Design. We are a nonprofit consulting firm that focuses on a variety of different issue areas that conservation and environmental organizations often face, whether it's uh, strategic planning and community engagement to uh, monitoring and evaluation and organizational change management. Um, but today's focus is going to be more specifically on some of the fundamental principles of behavior change, how we sort of build and incorporate behavior change into our strategies, and then um, specifically how do we think about measuring and evaluating the impact of our behavior change work. Um, so Judy shared this picture of me, um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, that's me in uh, 20 years ago, I keep saying it's 10 years ago, but then I get corrected and find out it was actually 20 years ago. Um, when I was working and living in Cameroon, um, I spent a lot of my work um, working internationally on science and research design, whether or not it's in the um, ecological sciences or the social sciences, um, really thinking about how we collect data um, in a way that allows us to learn and improve our impact. Um, I've worked on a variety of different species and systems um, so that I have a broad understanding of um, how we collect data from an ecological and social context. And as Judy mentioned, I worked for a number of different organizations, um, nonprofit organizations before starting IBD, including um, a, a really meaningful time working at the organization RARE, which is where I was exposed to uh, the behavior change science and uh, the work that's associated with implementing a behavior change campaign. Um, and then it was just a little over two years ago that I started uh, Impact by Design, uh, which is an organization focused on uh, the variety of different tools and techniques that um, uh, we mentioned before in training m and &E, uh, strategic planning. So very excited to be here and looking forward to launching this webinar. So this webinar is going to be in four parts. So the first piece is really going to be focused on the roots of um, behavior change uh, campaigns, essentially understanding the science and the principles of how you actually implement a behavior change campaign. Um, then we talk about what are those fundamental principles that you can then specifically apply. So we'll allow you to, to walk through some specific questions for um, thinking about and implementing your own behavior change campaign. Um, and then in the last piece, we'll talk about a tool called the theory of change. Um, but specifically, we'll talk about how you think about using a theory, theory of change in a behavior change context. And then we absolutely want to leave time for question and answer. Um, as Judy mentioned, we're going to be doing some poll voting. So we will um, we will be um, sorry. We will be using both the polls and the chat rooms to be able to communicate with you. Um, and specifically, we're going to start with this first poll. So, Kristen, this question is: What aspect of this webinar are you most excited about today? And what you'll see is you can provide an answer, and then we'll be able to show the group uh, how many responses. Uh, we get. So just give everybody a minute to respond. Okay, Kristen, what are we seeing? Great, so we have a number of people who are interested in the behavior change piece, uh, the behavior change and the fundamental principles of designing a campaign. Um, and then of course, a variety of, most of the folks who have responded so far is really thinking about measuring impact um, and the theory of change and key indicators. Um, so I will certainly, uh, the, I would say the first half of the uh, webinar is focused on the behavior change piece, but I'll make sure that we spend a little bit more time um, on the end uh, part around measuring and evaluating the impact. Okay, so first I just want to start talking about the fundamental principles, the science of, of social marketing. So I have another poll for you. I want you to let me know if you, it is, you, know, you know that it is important to exercise every day.
Okay, Kristen, what are those results? Okay. <laughs> so we have 95% of the people on the webinar know that it's important to exercise every day. Second question, second poll or third poll, are you willing to exercise every day? Okay, Kristen, what are we seeing? Right. So all of a sudden we go from knowing uh, at almost 100% being willing to exercise every day, things have changed a bit. Let's do one more. Did you exercise today? Okay, what's the results from that? Okay, half the people saying yes, they did exercise today and half the people, a little over half the people saying no, they didn't exercise today. So the question that I have for the group is that, you, you know, the first question was about, do you know it's important to exercise every day? And everybody said that they knew that it was important to exercise every day. Um, but then when you talked about whether or not you were willing to exercise every day or uh, you actually did exercise today, that number got drastically reduced. So a couple questions for the chat box. If we know it's important to exercise every day, why do we, and, and we know it's important even though we know we should, why don't we? What are those greatest barriers that keep us from exercising? Time, it's a low priority. Inconvenience. I'm seeing priorities, time, lots of pro direction, work, work and family commitments, time, space, motivation, fatigue, running your own business, motivation, laziness, and stress. Yes. Okay, so these are all sorts of things that keep us um, from exercising every day, even though we know it's important. And so I, I use that exercise to help people understand that this is one of the reasons why incorporating human behavioral science into the way we think about our environmental work is really, really important to us. Um, and it's because it helps us really understand all of those potential drivers for what motivates us. Um, and really helps us think about why we do the things we do, particularly as it relates to those behaviors that we might want to change or improve, like something like exercise. It helps us think about our target audiences as it relates to what are the specific barriers um, that they have in, let's say it's exercise or doing something else every day. What are the benefits that they may get? What are people really motivated by and how are they influenced by the sort of social community aspect of behavior change? And then finally, what kinds of things actually influence the way we make uh, decisions? So how does behavior change show up in our society? Um, one question I have for you in the chat box, again, is which one do you prefer? Would you prefer one? a glass of brown fizzy water with lots of corn syrup and sugar in it, or two, happiness. Let's see what we say in the chat box. Lots and lots of happiness. Okay, <laughs> lots of happiness. Most happiness, okay, great. So the reason why I mention that is when we think about something like Coke, Coke is actually basically a glass jar full of brown, fizzy, sugary water, but that's definitely not what they're selling, right? When they think about what they want to promote to their audiences and really engage them in a way that gets them excited about what they're trying to get them to do, they talk about the things that they care about that might be compelling to them. So in this case, they actually talk about happiness and not actually the brown fizzy water. 
And that's because corporate marketers really understand behavioral science and think about how they use it in a way to influence whether or not people will purchase something, how they feel about a product, or whether or not they'll continue to purchase those products over time. Um, and so we like to think a lot about how do they actually do that. And one of the exciting things um, for me, because I'm sort of a data nerd, is that these organizations think a lot about what data that they need in order to def or to sell something like Coke. How do you sell brown fizzy water to people? Who do I sell it to? Who's gonna drink Coke? When are they gonna drink it? How often? Um, what do they care about on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the things that they believe in um, from a social, religious, or practical perspective? What kind of benefits do they get from drinking Coke? And why do they drink Coke in the first place? Um, so organizations or, or companies like Coca-Cola actually spend a lot of money thinking about these questions and collecting data on these types of questions so that they can be really explicit about how they design um, their marketing campaigns. So what does, and actually I'll, I'll put this to the chat box, what does thinking about how Coke sells brown fizzy water, what does this have to do with behavior change for the environment? What do people think? Why do we care about Coke? Yeah, the same questions apply, right? So it's a successful model. They really think about what people value. They understand um, people and that is so key to behavior change. And buying something is like behavior change, right? So we may not be selling the same kinds of things and it may be more challenging for us um, to sell the types of behaviors in an environmental and a conservation context that we're interested in, but certainly some of the same fundamental principles apply. So um, I wanted to mention that you know, social marketing has basically built from these types of marketing principles to really think about how we can communicate and effectively reach various audiences to change behaviors. So whether or not you're talking about something from an anti-smoking or obesity campaign to something like litter, Social marketing is an approach that's used to develop specific activities that are aimed at changing or maintaining people's behavior. But the most important thing is that it's a benefit for the individuals and society as a whole. That's what differs you know, traditional marketing from social marketing, even though behavior change campaigns use behavioral science and communications tactics that may look very similar. So what does it actually take to run an effective behavior change campaign? So um, importantly, I think it's um, valuable for us to understand that there is a ton of science, um, behavioral economics, psychology, social and cognitive theory, psychology and learning theory. There's no one specific uh, scientific theory that we rely on in order to think about how to influence behaviors in the environmental space. Um, but we take all of these different principles and kind of mix them together to try to come up with some fundamental principles that we can use to design our campaigns. Um, but also it includes the artistic side of things. So how do we take that science and think creatively about how to access people from an emotional perspective? How do we create outreach programs that are creative, that really reach people where they are? Um, how do we create games or competition um, that will uh, be effective in helping to support and shift behavior changes over time? So when we think about behavior change, we think about it as a mix between both the science and behavioral economics and psychology and the art. So has anybody in this group actually experienced social marketing campaigns or a behavior change campaign of any kind? If so, if you can put it in the chat room. So many. Waste, yep. Reducing disturbances to wildlife, don't mess with Texas, electricity use, anti-litter, smoking campaigns, yep. Yeah, palm oil, plastics, cigarettes, turning off the tap, texting and driving, yeah, that's a big one lately. Recycling, yep. 
So those are all sort of um, both environmental and social health. Um, you know, the health field has actually been um, very successful in um, applying behavioral principles um, to, um, to the development of these types of, uh, of campaigns to change people's behaviors. Um, but you can see them across a variety of different social and um, environmental contexts. So let's go, let's move into sort of, actually, I'll take a pause here and see if there's any questions so far before we move into the fundamental principles of behavior change science. Amiel, I don't see any questions. There was okay. one comment that I thought was interesting that you might touch on. Mm. Um, it was from Adina talking about how a lot of the benefits of social marketing benefit the individual. The struggle in environmental behavior change is to motivate people to change behaviors that benefit others and the benefits may not be immediately visible. So I think that'll come up later as you're talking about things. Yeah, yeah. So I'll talk a little bit later about how we figure out um, what are sort of the benefits and barriers that we're actually selling as part of one of those campaigns and really figuring out how we get inside the heads for our target audiences um, to help them realize the types of benefits that um, we are interested in selling or asking for as part of that behavior change campaign. And, and one other question to think about, um, Amy asked how to sway the biologists and scientists in charge, that communication is more important. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, I will say, I mean, from my sense, and I know there's a, a bunch of other folks on the uh, on the line who work in this space, and I'd be curious to hear from them from the chat room perspective. My sense is that um, we're starting to understand, uh, the community is starting to understand that uh, conservation and environmental uh, conservation is all actually about humans and human behavior. Um, so I see an increasing role for social scientists, um, for behavior change experts, um, for, yep, and so Cassie says, yes, I agree. I really feel like this is something that is taking off um, where uh, as, as important as it is to understand the status of um, species that are going extinct across the globe and what the drivers of uh, are of that extinction process, at the end of the day, most of the drivers are behavioral and so bringing our social scientists and our behavioral experts to the table has started to become um, a priority. Um, yep, and Brooke is saying the conservation psychology sessions uh, at the current conservation biology NACCB conference was standing room only. Yep, and I've noticed the same thing um, that, that these are, it's really changing um, in, the, in the ways that I see participation in these types of conferences and conversations that are happening across the, across the globe. Um, Naomi did ask about target audiences and we're, we're actually going to get there in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, so let's talk briefly about the behavioral science aspect. Um, so as I mentioned, there are, you know, hundreds of different uh, papers and theoretical frameworks that we can build from to better understand um, human behavioral psychology. Um, the way IBD thinks about it is how do we take and distill a lot of that science into um, practical considerations for how people think and do um, as it relates to uh, the environment and environmental behaviors. So there are things like the theory of planned behavior or social cognitive um, theory that help us think about social norms and knowledge and how do attitudes play a role and what are the behavioral factors around um, skills and practice and, and, and self-advocacy. Um, but what today I wanted to focus on um, is just a distilled sort of list of things that we should be considering for our um, behavioral strategies. Uh, one is that people get overwhelmed. Um, if you've ever had a to-do list that's so long so that you end up sitting in, in bed and, and watching movies and eating ice cream because it's just so overwhelming. Um, one is that people are overwhelmed by uh, too many choices, too many different things that they need to do. Uh, another fundamental piece that we'll talk about the science of is that people are different and that might not come as a total surprise or perhaps um, silly to even think that we need to have science around that. Um, but people really do differ in, in what they value, what they're motivated by. We need to think about that as it relates to behavior change. 
um, we are strongly influenced by each other. Um, and that plays a huge role in how we think about various behaviors and what it takes to mobilize individuals and communities over time. Um, we are also uh, programmed to do the easiest option for us. Um, and so the ability for us to make change easy is gonna be a critical part of our behavior change work. Um, and then finally, uh, just a piece on the emotional aspect. It may come as no surprise to you that people are uh, more emotionally driven than they may be rationally driven. And we need to think about the science of that explicitly as it relates to designing behavior change campaigns. So before we get started, um, I uh, should have mentioned, I'd love for you to have a piece of paper or at least something, something to write on. You can write on, um, on, on your computer because I have a number of key things for you to, to think about as you think about behavior change science in your work. So before we move on to some of the additional fundamental principles, take a moment to consider what kinds of behavior changes you might be considering in your work or are you currently working on? What behaviors would you wanna target within your project or your community? And there's a couple of different things that you um, could, could use as uh, criteria for deciding what behaviors might be valuable for you to focus on, whether or not they're a high priority for your community, whether or not it's something you could start as low hanging fruit, you think you can actually achieve something really quickly, um, whether or not it would have a high impact on your environmental goals or whether or not it might be a gateway behavior to other behaviors. So just take a minute. And if you're thinking about some things, feel free to share in the chat room some of the things that you're thinking about. Littering, planting habitats like milkweed, water quality awareness, improving wildlife corridors, water conservation, water pollution prevention, driving less, using less plastic, overfishing, shoreline restoration, keeping pets or cats inside, low carbon behaviors, runoff pollution. Yeah, these are great. Food waste, Recycling, litter, yeah. So these are great. So there are a ton of different things that, um, that we could uh, potentially focus on. Um, and so throughout the, the, the remaining sort of principles, I'm gonna have you be thinking about um, the various uh, behavior changes that you're thinking about with your work. And then we can talk about um, how they influence some of the choices that you may, might make from a behavior change perspective. So let's start talking about the first principle. So um, before I asked you about exercise, I love this picture. This is from a, um, a specific type of gym in uh, the United States. And first question I have for you is, if you were to walk into this gym and you weren't sure what to do, how would seeing this gym make you feel? And you can put your answers in the chat room. <laughs> Scared intimidated, too many options, lost, excited. <laughs> Somebody wrote, wondering why I'm the only person there. <laughs> Bored, confused, yeah. Oh yeah, glad you're not gonna have to wait in line because there's nobody there. Um, so, so one of the things um, that, that uh, we know from a behavior change perspective is that, you know, as humans, we're actually love to have lots of options. Um, but in order to be able to, you know, be empowered to do a particular behavior, it's sort of the opposite. So the more, the more options that we have, the less likely we are actually able to do something. And that's because people have a tendency to act to get overwhelmed um, when they are faced with too many choices. And what that means from a behavior change perspective is that we wanna really focus on one specific ask. 
So even though we express a desire for abundant options, um, we have a tendency to then suffer decision paralysis and then, and then do none of those. And I'm going to give you an example um, of, a, of a study that was done based on selling jam in a supermarket. So option A in the chat room is, is what you see here, those three, seven um, jars of jam. And then option B is the 15 or 30 so jars of jam that you see there. So which of the tables do you think shoppers were more likely to visit? Put your answers in the chat room. Okay, lots of A's, lots of B's. Okay, great. Second question. Which table was the shopper more likely to purchase jam, A or B? Yeah. So the funny thing is, is that shoppers were more likely to visit table B. They wanted all of those additional choices. They had a, 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 a desire to seek out those additional choices and have all of those different options. But when it actually came to them choosing a particular jam or actually going and buying a jar of jam, they were much more likely to purchase that jam if they went to table A. And so this just reflects our sort of the dichotomy that we have in our head that we want all of these choices, but actually we're much more likely to do something if we have less choices. So from a behavior change, per change perspective and applying the science, we suggest that you focus on one behavior at a time, creating one ask or action um, to make sure that you're not, that you are avoiding decision paralysis. We give an example here of a very succinct ask around sea turtles and straws. Um, skip the straw is a, is a, a very specific one ask um, that we can ask of, of potential consumers. I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions in the chat room. So Colleen was asking if option B has only two choices, just several. So option B was a variety of different choices. Let's say like imagine tons of different choices of, of jam, where option A was very few choices of jam. So people were just more likely to go to the table that had tons of different choices of jam, different kinds of each, of each um, as well as um, the, and then the first one, they, option A, um, they were just much more likely to buy the jam, even though they were more likely to go to the table with more types of jam in option B. Any other questions? Yeah, so Heidi is asking, um, Heidi is asking, does taking one action provide the sticky ball on which related choices and actions are made? Right, so um, in order for um, people to, uh, so we're recommending that you focus on one particular behavior uh, because it's uh, easier for people to focus on that, but it doesn't mean that later on there can't be more actions or activities that you can use to support that particular behavior over time. Um, and then the last question I see, um, I sent questions, oh, how do you accommodate for people with different capacities to take action? Not everyone can commute my, by bike, for example. Um, so one of the things that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit is actually how you segment your audience and then provide solutions for various types of audiences so that you can make sure you're really reaching each of those segments um, in a way that can be reached. Okay, so. So as we recommend doing creating one action or having it be really simple and straightforward, we do not recommend doing something like this, where um, as you can see, this is a, a group that's particularly trying to focus on climate change activities and trying to suggest that there's all sorts of different things that you can do to empower you. Um, but in many ways, this may make people feel actually overwhelmed by the number of choices that they have. And it's not quite as clear as um, it may seem like it would be for, um, for, for us. 
So before we move on, and you th if you think about the groups of or um, the various behaviors that you're thinking about focusing on, is there one specific behavior, one specific action that you would like um, your target audiences to take that's most important? Waste reduction. Tatiana, think about what kind of waste you really want to focus on. Leaving dog shit everywhere sounds very specific. <laughs> Great. Putting waste in waste bins. Great. Okay, so just want to move on. So in principle two, um, this is a, may not be surprising for folks, but there are some really specific ways that this influences the way we think about using the science to target our, our, our campaigns. So, um, you know, people in our potential target audiences may be different in a variety of different ways, whether or not it's age, their key influencers, religion, education, barriers to change, the trusted sources of information, motivators, um, and their personal beliefs. And this actually affects the way we think about reaching out to them in a variety of different ways. So for example, if you were to look at this community the, of pictures here, what are the um, various ways that you think, um, what do you think would actually motivate this group to be healthier, eat better, or exercise more? What do you think would motiv motivate this group? You can use the chat box. Grandchildren. Live longer. Longevity. Quality of life. Feel well. Free food. <laughs> Self-sufficiency. Great. Yep. So I, yeah, so this is great. So lots of creative thinking here. And you know, a lot of times um, people would see this group, this group and say that they wanna eat healthier and, and, and practice healthier behaviors because they wanna live longer. But actually in a, in a study um, in, in 2006 that they did among older folks um, that the three top things that, that were really important to them as it related to eating healthy and exercising actually had to do with their ability to be independent um, their ability to contribute and, and uh, maintain relationships with their family, um, and also uh, being able to continue to contribute to global good. Um, so even though longevity would seem like the obvious thing to a number of us, it actually was not the number one thing that actually was most important for this um, particular target audience. And so this just helps us understand that our outreach and our strategies that we would use for behavior change in this case around healthy behaviors um, would would actually be different depending on the data that we collect about what it is that people really care about the same is true of young people so um, there are a surprising set of things that potentially young people would be more interested in as it related to um, eating better and taking care of themselves new having new experiences being healthy so that they can achieve personal and professional goals. These are the types of things once we actually collected some data um, uh, actually influence uh, how and why these individuals would be motivated to change their behavior. So when you think about your behavior change campaign, somebody mentioned before, what if some of our target audience isn't mobile and can't use a bike? You may really need to think about who explicitly is the part of your audience that you're focused on? Who is doing the behavior and not doing the behavior that you really wanna change? Um, and how are they different from everybody else? How do you reach them? You can think about things like gender that may differentiate them, education, age, um, socioeconomic status, their values, really thinking about things about what they care about, religious affiliations, um, but also thinking about various barriers. What are the different barriers that different um, parts of your target audience um, may actually be experiencing in relation to, in, to, to change? So this is the type of thing that you'll need to think about um, as it relates to designing your uh, campaign and using data to drive um, the strategies that you implement. 
So making sure that you be specific about defining your target audience based on some shared characteristics and collecting the data that you need to really understand who your target audience is. So is it men? Is it women? What is the age group? What is their education? Um, what are their likes and dislikes? What are their values? What is their so socioeconomic status? Um, and really think very deeply about how that might influence your behavior change campaign. Because as we talked about in the beginning, um, the most important important thing um, that I think we need to understand as conservationists and environmentalists is that it's not about us, it's, it's about them and what they think about and care about and value. So as before we move on, just want to make sure um, we give you a chance to think about your target audience. Who is your target audience um, in a behavior change campaign that you would be implementing? What characteristics um, do they have that might be important for you to consider? Mm -hmm. Developers. Conservation scientists. Middle school students, children. Okay. Great. Somebody asked a question about how do you actually find out about your target audience if you don't, um, if they don't respond to your poll? That's a great question. Um, there's a variety of different data collection techniques we can use in order to better understand your target audience. Um, there are certainly some extreme cases where you won't actually be able to reach or access them, but whether or not you can sit down and have a personal conversation with somebody in your target audience to really deeply understand what they're experiencing as it relates to that behavior, get the perspective of, you know, friends and family or other influencers in that community around individuals in that target audience. Um, if they're not willing to take an online poll or a social survey, um, consider uh, something, something where you are going and meeting individuals face to face in the places that they may go and spend time like cafes or um, in community centers. So depending on where your target audience is, is um, spending time, uh, you may want to think about some customized, more qualitative data that you can use to um, that you can use to better understand uh, what your target audience um, thinks and feels. Um, also, observation can be really valuable. So, um, even if you're observing your target audiences from afar to see how they spend their days and their time, um, and uh, what the types of choices that they're making. Um, that, it, that would be a powerful way for you to start getting inside the heads of your target audiences and really figuring out who they might be. Um, as far as, so last um, couple of principles I wanna touch on. Um, as we mentioned, you know, with the exercise example, everybody knows that it's important to exercise every bit, every day, but not everybody's doing it. And that's mainly, most of the, uh, examples in the chat box included people being tired and overworked. Um, so the, the fundamental principle here is just that knowledge is not enough. Um, so going to do poll number five, Kristen, which of the following do you think contributes to people's decisions about whether or not to change their behavior? Okay, what are we seeing? Yeah, so whether it's an easy change to make, so that's actually really, really critically important, what my friends think, also critically important, personal beliefs, value systems. Um, but for those of you who answered all of the above, um, that's, that's the key here, is that there are so many different things that actually influence the way um, or contributes to people's decisions about whether or not to change their behavior, um, that we need to think about all of the types of things that really drive and motivate people for change. Um, so, um, you know, as we experienced in the exercise example, uh, we've seen a sort of across the board that education is important, but it alone has uh, little or no effect on long-term sustainable behavior. So whether or not we're talking about examples with workshops and presentations and demonstrations, in this case from an older example about energy efficiency in your home, 
that did not lead to changes in behavior or a massive CO2 campaign in Canada that led to high levels of recognition and awareness, but almost 0% changes in behaviors, it's really important for us to understand that um, it's important for people to be aware about these issues and about the behaviors that we're hoping to get them to make, um, but we, uh, it does not necessarily lead to changes in behavior. So from our perspective, just making sure that teams are comfortable applying a variety of different tools and techniques um, in your sort of behavior change toolkit um, from environmental education, but also thinking about how we provide specific new tools and training, um, thinking about public opportunities for changing policy or getting key leaders to sign on to um, agreements, providing alternative behaviors, cultural festivals, and just there are so many more tools, but recognizing that there are should be a variety of different tools in your toolkit to help support um, and move your target audiences towards change. So as you think about um, implementing your behavior changes in your behavior change campaigns in the future, um, really get to know your target audience and think about what are all of the different things that we might need to implement in order to provide the enabling conditions for change. So just take a moment to think about your own behavior change campaign. So in addition to some of the things that you're currently doing or as you think about planning for a behavior change, what are some of the strategies that you may implement? And you can use the chat box. So um, Judy, do you, for the team, do you want to um, talk about some, some of the questions that you have? Yeah, so one of the questions that came in is, how do you tackle complicated issues or go for collective action, not just focused on individual behavior? Nice little question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so um, one of the things um, that we like to think about is, is that um, there's individual behaviors, but there's also community mobilization around um, those behaviors. Um, be, we want to think about not just um, those individual specific people who are doing the behaviors, but how do we create the enabling conditions and the support um, and the shift or social norms um, so that um, we can support a target audience and changing behaviors. Um, so, so that includes things like if you do a festival, for example, around changing food habits or food waste, um, we want to think that that doesn't necessarily mean that every single person at the festival is in our target audience, um, but that you're actually focused on the community in supporting the social norms that are um, helping that target audience to change behaviors um, or mobilizing the community um, for action. Yeah, and one more before you go in, Sharon asks, so in providing a variety of options, do we stick to one action call at the same time throughout? or different actions for different tools? Yeah, so I would say that it depends on, um, it depends on your, on your target audience. So if you can, re if you have sort of segmented target audience with slightly different asks and you can segment those asks and be really specific about them um, for, each, uh, for each audience. Uh, but also think about you don't have to do everything at one time. So you can start with one particular ask and then continue to um, add on to sort of that overarching campaign and ask over time. We'll okay, save, we'll save a few for later. There are a few others. Yep. So I want to move to um, Yep, so I want to move to um, the theory of change. Well, so I want to do actually, so let me do two things. So I thought we had a little bit more time, but um, the last um, principle that I want to focus on is um, related to how people uh, make changes. So this is really specific to the community mobilization piece that people were just uh, referring to. So I want you to think about 2004 and I want to think about what you were doing in that year. So just take a moment. You can write some things in the chat box. Anything special happened that year? What are some things that happened to you that year? Grad school, got married, Olympic games are in Greece. Excellent. 
Okay. So the other thing that happened in that year is Facebook became officially launched. And so when you think about, we're going to do a little bit of a quick poll. What year did you join Facebook? So poll Kristen. Okay. What are some of the results? Okay, so we got 25% in 2004 to 2006, a nice mix of people across the curve. And what that's about is that different individuals within our groups, when we think about behavior change, they adopt new ideas and behaviors at different rates. And this is based on a ton of data that we know about this diffusion of innovation, which has to do with how individuals um, adopt new behaviors over time. And so we need to think about that in the design of our behavior change campaigns um, as, uh, uh, as we implement our campaigns and where our communities are in relation to adopting new behaviors. So in the early stages, we wanna think about identifying and fostering those innovations, create then later on creating social pressure and fostering trust, um, and then think about le legal or policy reinforcement. Somebody ask about punitive measures um, as it relates to um, reinforcing behavior changes over time. So these are some of the things that we want to think about um, as it relates to designing and implementing our behavior change campaigns. So you want to create opportunities for social reinforcement and advertise that everybody is doing it. I want to move on to um, the, the theory of change as it relates to um, uh, as it, sorry, I wanted to move on to the theory of change as it relates to how we think about behavior change and then how we think about measuring our impact. So before uh, we move on, just want to see how many of you have heard of the theory of change before? Okay, Kristen, results? Okay, so we got some people who have never heard of it, some people who have heard of it but never used it, and some people who have used it before. We like to think, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this video so we have a little bit more time for, actually, yeah, so we have a little bit more time for questions. But a theory of change is basically a strategic planning tool that we use to demonstrate how our strategies lead to short-term outcomes and long-term goals. Um, so instead of actually saying, you know, that a miracle occurs after we implement our strategy, uh, we actually uh, really try to be specific about how our strategies lead to short and long-term goals. So for example, if we implement our, our behavior change camp campaign, what kinds of short-term outcomes do we expect in order for us to achieve our long-term goals? It's a series of if-then statements that allow us to be really clear um, about what needs to happen in the short and the long term on the way to achieving our goals. So here's an example of um, K through 12 education. So in this case, in this theory of change, you have an increase in knowledge um, and attitudes about the environment, building skills and confidence, um, increased willingness to adopt pro-environmental behaviors, but importantly, in this case, they wanted to acknowledge that they're actually using kids um, to access their families and make sure um, that their families are actually in pro, exposed to pro-environmental literacy. Um, and then ultimately increase in the number of individuals who adopt pro-environmental behaviors, decreasing threats to wildlife and habitat over time. And what's really powerful about the theory of change is it allows us to figure out what is it exactly that we need to measure and evaluate in order to demonstrate that we're making a difference. And so as we think about our education and our behavior change campaigns, we want to, um, we can use the theory of change to highlight what are those key elements that we need to evaluate um, and measure over time in order to achieve our long term goals. So oftentimes when people come to us and say, we want to measure everything, we walk them through a theory of change approach that allows them to um, be really specific about what they want to achieve in the short and the long term. So then your, your monitoring and evaluation indicators are then tied to um, what your theory of change is over time. So you can identify specific indicators that are tied to specific outcomes. Um, and they can also alert you to problems um, so that if there are changes in your indicator in the short term, um, you know that there's something that's going wrong. 
There are a number of specific outcomes and indicators that you could be measuring depending on the work that you're doing. So here's just a couple of examples. And then finally, I just want to highlight a couple of examples of how this is applied in practice. So this is from some work I was doing when I was at the organization Rare, which is a behavior change campaign which, with a theory of change that looks something like this. And we used a meta-analysis of 83 campaigns that allowed us to actually evaluate whether or not there were significant changes in knowledge and attitudes um, and behaviors over time. Um, and this paper that we were able to get that were that is currently in review this year um, allowed us to demonstrate that social marketing and behavior change tools and techniques um, allows us to see significant changes, not just in knowledge and attitudes, but also in behaviors over time. Um, lastly, just wanted to give you a sense and I'm happy to share um, our slides with with the broader group so um, that you can look at these later on. Um, this is, IBD is working with a variety of different organizations across the globe to build a behavior change theory of change that works to um, change behaviors and reduce threats to conservation targets or conservation species. Um, we use this behavior change theory of change to identify specific indicators around things like changes in knowledge and attitudes, but also um, changes in the actual behavior itself, a level of confidence that people have in being able to do new behaviors or stop old ones, um, and a change in cultural acceptance of a behavior. And here is just a theory of change example of how this is applied um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo around great apes and hunting of great apes. So what you can see here is a behavior change campaign that's based on a ton of quantitative and qualitative data collection up front to really think about who the target audience is, in this case, the um, sellers of bushmeat, to really identify what are those changes in knowledge and attitudes and personal communications, um, changes in, in behavioral intention and social norms that need to happen in order to reduce hunting of great apes. Given that theory of change, and then I want to move to questions. Um, these are the types of things that we would identify um, using either social survey data or qualitative data co um, um, collection techniques to really identify how uh, our social marketing and our behavior change strategies are leading to changes um, over time in our theory of change. So lastly, just leaving you with, as you work on your theories of change for your behavior change strategies, think about what your long-term goal is, what strategies you need to employ to help your target audiences get there, and then what are the short-term outcomes that might need to be accomplished before your, role, before your goals can be achieved. So I will turn it over to the NAEE folks um, to see if they have specific questions that we can target. Thanks, Amiel. Since we only have a few minutes left, what if we did this? Um, we um, will encourage all of you in the chat box to ask any additional questions that you have. Um, I know there's been a lot of chat about more on theory of change. And Amiel, would you be willing to answer a few questions so that we can post it online? Absolutely. That would be absolutely fantastic. There's a lot more interest in theory of change and some of the other things that you've covered. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to give you a chance to just, are there any final thoughts you have, and then we'll wrap it up, of just what to leave our group with, because there's a ton of interest and so many good questions, and thank you for being able to share the PDF of this. Yes, absolutely. I mean, just that I love talking about these kinds of things, um, and there's so many potential things that we could uh, cover. Uh, just that uh, data collection and it, both qualitative and quantitative data collection to really understand where our target audiences are at is really critical both for the design um, and evaluation of our, um, of our behavior change campaigns. Um, and I'm happy to talk to folks about how to best uh, start creating a theory of change and just email me directly or go to our website if you'd like some more uh, references and resources on the theory of change. Thank you, Amiel. That's so wonderful. And Kristen is going to be posting a couple of other resources. One is the Tools of Engagement. Another one is a book by a colleague, Mark Stern, on social science and theories of sustainability. And there's a ton on logic models, results change, theory of change, 
And Amiel, would you be willing to come back and dig in more to theory of change in the future? Absolutely. And I'm going to turn this over to Kristen, but thank you, Amiel, for the final few slides. Sure, I'm just going to breeze through a couple housekeeping things. Um, just to reiterate from Judy, um, we will be sharing a recording of this webinar. You can find it on EE Pro. You will also receive an email tomorrow at 4 o'clock Eastern that will include a link to the recorded webinar as well as um, a list of resources that we um, have discussed and that have showed up in the chat um, related to conservation and theory of change. Um, it also sounds like Amiel is willing to um, help us with answering some questions via email and I'll post uh, that Q&A, um, written Q&A on um, EE Pro as well and you, you'll find that in the follow-up email as well. So lots of things to look forward to, more coming at you soon. We can go on to the next slide please. And just a reminder that our next webinar will be on September 19th at 3 o'clock Eastern. We'll hear from Dennis Poplin from Spitfire Strategies, who will teach us about how to make more of an impact giving presentations. And um, Sai is pasting a link to our a feedback survey um, in the chat box. Please feel free to take that. Let us know how we're doing. We'd love to be able to um, keep the webinar series going with topics and speakers you'd like to hear from and about. Um, you can give us your feedback on today's webinar as well as um, your ideas for future webinars. So please do take a second to do that if you'd like. Um, that'd be great, thank you. Um, just a reminder, early bird registration um, rates for our annual research symposium and conference ends on August 24th. Um, we hope to see you in Spokane. It'll be a great conference, October 9th to 13th. Early bird rates closing on August 24th. And that'll do it. Thank you so much for joining us and big thanks to Amiel for a lot of great thinking. Um, there's so much engagement in the chat box. We're looking forward to following up with a lot more resources and questions. So thanks to all of you and we hope to see you next month. Thanks everyone. Thanks Amiel. Thank you.